Hello, in this video we're going to talk about hepatorenal syndrome, which essentially involves the liver and the kidneys, how the liver causes uh, acute kidney injury. Hepatorenal syndrome is one of the many potential causes of acute kidney injury in patients with acute or chronic liver disease, including liver cirrhosis, severe alcoholic hepatitis, and fulminant liver failure. As we know, the heart pumps blood via the arteries to our systemic circulation, where it will deliver blood to the kidneys for more arteries, and eventually the blood returns to the heart via the veins. The heart also pumps blood to our uh, splanchnic circulation, which is a name given to describe blood being delivered to our gastrointestinal organs, such as the stomach and intestines. Therefore, these arteries are the celiac arteries, superior and inferior mesenteric arteries. The capillaries from the gastrointestinal tract will form veins, which will eventually become the portal venous system, which will enter the liver. The liver processes nutrients here before joining with the veins of the systemic circulation. Now, in liver injury, specifically liver cirrhosis, the fibrosis and injury can increase portal venous pressure, resulting in portal hypertension. When this happens, the portal vein tries to help by dilating the blood vessels to reduce the portal venous pressure by releasing nitric oxide from endothelial cells. Nitric oxide causes vasodilation of the arteries in the splanchnic circulation, and this will decrease total peripheral resistance or the systemic vascular resistance. As systemic vascular resistance falls, cardiac output increases to compensate for the decreased effective circulatory volume. Cardiac output is normally calculated by heart rate multiplied by stroke volume. Stroke volume will increase when your systemic vascular resistance falls and so cardiac output will increase. As the hepatic disease becomes more severe, the splanchnic arterial vasodilation and reduced systemic vascular resistance leads to reduced effective circulatory volume. Reduced effective circulatory volume means less blood is actually getting to the kidneys. The kidneys react by activating the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which will increase cardiac output and will try to increase systemic vascular resistance via angiotensin II, direct action on the blood vessels, and by aldosterone's action on the kidneys, increasing sodium retention and thereby reducing sodium excretion. The body will also increase sympathetic activity to increase systemic vascular resistance. Hypovolemia results in an increase in antidiuretic hormone and water retention in the kidneys to try to increase systemic vascular resistance as well. The angiotensin II causes vasoconstriction to the efferent arterioles, attempting to raise glomerular filtration rate. At the end of the day, uh, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system will maintain all this fluid and sodium, and you have a decrease in urine sodium output. Unfortunately, in liver disease, all this fluid leaks out, resulting in peripheral edema and ascites. And so despite this mechanism, the kidneys still become underperfused due to the fall in systemic vascular resistance. And so the importance of splanchnic vasodilation in hepatorenal pathophysiology can be indirectly illustrated by the response to ornipressin, an analog of antidiuretic hormone. Uh, and this analog, uh, this antidiuretic hormone analog, is a preferential splanchnic vasoconstrictor. And so administration of ornipressin partially corrects many of the systemic and renal hemodynamic abnormalities that are present, and these include an increasing the mean arterial pressure, reducing plasma renin activity, as well as adrenaline, noradrenaline concentration. Ornipressin increases renal blood flow, increases glomerular filtration, 
as well as increasing urinary sodium excretion and volume. Patients with hepatorenal syndrome have an overall poor prognosis without liver, tr liver transplantation. Generally, management includes discontinuing diuretics, restricting sodium intake, restricting water intake in hyponatremic patients, and searching for the precipitating factor. Therapeutic interventions include treatment with vasoconstrictors um, as well as albumin. You can also place a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt in selected patients. There is also renal replacement therapy and liver transplant. Renal replacement therapy is usually reserved for patients with severe acute kidney injury who are liver transplant candidates. Transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt is a pretty cool thing. It's literally what the name says uh, or suggests. It's a transjugular uh, from the jugular vein. Uh, a shunt is placed between the portal vein and the hepatic vein. And this shunt allows blood to bypass the liver, reducing portal venous pressure. It's important to talk about the precipitants of hepatorenal syndrome. The onset of kidney failure is typically insidious, but can be precipitated by an acute insult, such as spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is an important cause, because as we know, portal hypertension causes ascites, and this acidic fluid increases the risk of bacterial colonization. Another important precipitating factor include gastrointestinal bleeding from portal hypertension and varices, forming in the esophagus or stomach. The hepatorenal syndrome is characterized by evident acute or chronic liver disease, a progressive rise in serum creatinine, and often normal urine sediment, no or minimal proteinuria, a very low rate of sodium excretion, so low urine sodium, as well as non-oligouria or oligouria, depending on the severity. Now, based upon the rapidity of the decline in renal function, there are two forms of hepatorenal syndrome. Type 1 hepatorenal syndrome is the more serious type. It is defined as at least a twofold increase in serum creatinine. It is also supported by the lack of improvement in kidney functions after withdrawal of diuretics and two days of volume expansion with intravenous albumin. Type 2 hepatorenal syndrome is less severe. The major clinical feature in patients with type 2 hepatorenal syndrome is ascites that is resistant to diuretics. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Hepatorenal syndrome is a pretty complicated topic, but essentially it's where you have splanchnic vasodilation from nitric oxide. And this essentially causes the AKI. There are two main types, type 1 and type 2, type 1 being more severe.